Okay, I'm not going to spoil literally every Zelda game, but it's pretty dang close, so heads up and, um... Also, I'm gonna spoil Animorphs. The first Zelda game I ever played was The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. It was the first real game I got for my Nintendo Wii. Arguably the first real game I ever beat. Certainly, it felt the most meaningful at the time. Twilight Princess was the first encounter I ever had with the land of Hyrule, or Link, or Zelda, or Ganondorf. And in some ways, it's an ironic place for a kid to start out. Because Twilight Princess is the darkest Zelda. I felt it right when I started the game. The first scene of Twilight Princess is drenched in melancholy. Two grown men sitting together at dusk. Loneliness always pervades the hour of twilight, one says. The only time we can feel the lingering regrets of spirits who have left our world. And after defining the twilight as a time of loneliness, a time of crossing over, the game proceeds to set a huge amount of its story at that very time, the entire kingdom shrouded in burnt orange and shadows. This is a story that's sparked by Princess Zelda giving up, averting a slaughter by conceding Hyrule to violent usurpers. It's a story where all the people know is fear, where nature itself is cowed. And shaped by the world, our protagonist Link is also at his most dangerous. He and everything else in the game are drawn with a more realistic brush than previous titles. He's an adult throughout, he scowls in his key art, he turns into a wolf, a badass, dangerous animal. When Link learns new fighting moves, he learns them from a dead and decaying older version of himself. When he finishes an enemy, he does it by plunging his sword into their heart. Twilight Princess is the only Zelda to be rated T for teen. This isn't the Zelda game for everyone, so declares the ESRB. The thematic threads of the game are far from a simple save the princess narrative. Instead, they weave around notions of power, who wields it, why they seek it out, and what they intend to do with it. For example, this is the game that introduces Zant, an unpredictable, unreadable antagonist. Zant seeks violence and power in an attempt to merge his shadow world with the light and throw everything into darkness. And he's not just driven by villainy, but a deranged impatience at the plotting, ineffectual monarchy of the land he's from. His need for conquest ties him to another power seeker, Ganondorf, depicted in this game as a near god. The Ganondorf Zant is a puppet, briefly used, discarded immediately. Even Midna, Link's impish companion, is motivated by this need for strength. A huge amount of the game revolves around Midna's quest for the fused shadow, a catalyst for a power she's barely able to control, a tool that, when she first receives it, she immediately uses to just murder someone. Even Link himself, Nintendo's most famous silent protagonist, a cipher for goodness and heroism, experiences his own reckoning with the nature of absolute power. In perhaps the game's most famous cutscene, Link watches a story of the world's genesis, one that doubles as a history of its conflicts. Himself and his childhood crush play both Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, turning on each other for the slightest chance at the strength of the Triforce. It is a scary and disturbing scene, full of dark voids, dead pupiled heroes, and genuine terror from the characters. It also, most unexpectedly of all, ends with imagery that implies a power-fueled lust from Link. Dozens of copies of the lever he just struck down now float towards him, a glimpse of what he might do were he given the magic of the gods. Then Link passes out, overwhelmed by the premonition. Twilight Princess's visuals are consistently striking. Certain scenes border on avant-garde. The final battle with Ganondorf, huge, climactic, ends with a strike played in silence against a background blasted white. The former villain, Zant, appears for just a moment and seems to snap his own neck. In that moment, Ganondorf dies too. And then the three just stand, wordless, silhouetted by the setting sun.
One of the great joys of getting older and marginally wiser is going back to old favorite media and discovering new aspects of it. I'm sure everyone has had the experience of returning to a favorite movie or book and finding stuff that was always there but too subtle or mature for our kid brains to pick up on. The most basic and probably most common version of this is just humor, jokes that went over our heads. I have this, this tiny, uh, little, little... I'm Mary Jane. Like, that is my favorite name. Really? Yeah. These jokes rarely add much depth or complexity to a work, unless you consider Shaggy liking weed or animated characters making dick jokes complexity. They're more like concessions to teens and parents, winks to the knowing. They're indications that, yeah, this movie was made for kids, but it was made by adults who know what weed and dicks are. A more advanced version of the adult jokes are full-blown parodies of things a younger audience may have never encountered. I'm sure I'm not the only one who watched a so random episode of The Simpsons as a kid, only to have a sudden understanding years later while watching The Shining, or Cape Fear, or A Streetcar Named Desire. Can't you hear me, Ella? You're putting me through hell. Walking backwards into culture like this was an integral part of my childhood and let me feel like I was experiencing something that was beyond what I had already felt. But the much more exciting and meaningful revelations typically occurred when the revisited piece of media didn't just hold adult jokes, but whole themes and philosophies that we never consciously clocked. Some of the absolute classics of kids' literature, The Giving Tree, The Little Prince, A Wrinkle in Time, are classics in large part due to how mature the themes are. They're not hiding their depth or making it inaccessible. Those books are just writing about emotional experiences that children likely haven't fully articulated yet. Part of being a kid is wondering why a grown-up is crying while reading a book about a tree out loud, and part of being an adult is being the crying reader. And I think, even without comprehending everything going on, you can sense that richness as a child. You know that there are things in this that are going a little over your head, even if you're not quite sure how to name them. It's what made books and movies and games feel great and powerful and unknowable. I think what I wanted most as a kid was the feeling that media wasn't talking down to me. I wanted to be given feelings I didn't have the words to explain. It's why Twilight Princess was so exciting. Yes, this was a video game. Yes, it was on the Wii. But I could point to the darkness, to the things I didn't quite understand, and say, there's something there. If you're familiar with the Zelda series production history, you probably know about the development of The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. It was a game made in less than two years to capitalize on the runaway success of Ocarina of Time. It's why the scale of the game is smaller and some of the assets reused. And yet, either despite or because of this frenzied production, directors Aonuma and Koizumi somehow ended up making Majora's Mask the darkest Zelda. Is there a more unsettling start screen than Majora's Mask? Silence, except for the mask spinning past, the salesman exalting it like a divine object as one or both of them <laughs> cackle, the tranquil scenes of Clock Town eventually revealed to be under a horrible moon, inexorably falling towards Earth. And then, immediately upon beginning the game, an opening crawl tells you that Link has crept away from the land that made him a legend wording that conjures the image of a boy unable to handle the fame and heroism placed upon him. And then we see him, slowly plodding through a tall, dark forest, until he's suddenly robbed, dragged alongside his horse, and falls down an enormous hollow trunk, buffeted by mysterious symbols all the way. He's transformed against his will, and meets the man from the opening who asks, You've met with a terrible fate, haven't you? And then he finds out the world is going to end. Three days is all the time Link has to gather the giants and solve every problem and somehow push the moon back into the sky. It's an impossible task and not enough time, not nearly, and it's all put on the back of a child who's already fleeing the weight of his expectations. 
It is an unfair request for Termina to make of Link, but it's one he has to fulfill all the same. Majora's Mask is a game about fighting inevitability, about seeing the dark fate of everything over and over and over again. The annihilation caused by the moon falling into Earth isn't simply a fail state, but a threat that the player has to use, confronting people in the midst of their grief or denial, while the bringer of mass death hangs just overhead. The clock tower rings again and again and again. This is how the world ends. This is how the world ends. It's 5.30. It's 5.40. It's 5.50. It's... It's no surprise that Majora's Mask is host to far more theories and urban legends than the rest of the series. Thousands argue that the game's major missions represent the stages of grief. They say even the game's structure is wrapped around the sense of mourning. One step further, another theory says, Link has actually been dead since the very beginning, each person and creature another manifestation of his dying mind. Not only that, says the internet legend, but the themes extend beyond the game's programming. Ben Drowned, the most notorious video game horror story, a dead boy's spirit said to remain within this cartridge. It makes sense, in the logic of spooky myth. What game could he possibly inhabit except this one, a game made for children yet obsessed with death? All of this seems to circle around the character of Skull Kid, a particular fixation, a tragic figure, a child made into a husk, the subject of a horror movie we're only privy to a fraction of. You can't blame the memers, either. So much of Majora's Mask feels like it lives in the realm of exaggerated playground stories, bits and pieces you'd hear about from friends that couldn't possibly be real. Link doesn't just transform into other creatures when he puts on a mask, he does so in a seemingly agonizing process. Those masks aren't generic figures either, they're dead characters in the game, some who perish right in front of us. It is a game in which you must inhabit the dead to continue. And as a cherry on top, you're eventually taught the Elegy of Emptiness, a song that manifests a statue of that previous life, except with blank, vacant eyes, or whatever the hell this is. It is not just an oppressive game thematically, it is oppressive mechanically, a ticker that gradually builds up the weight of the world on your shoulders over and over, only able to be offset, never removed. As a kid, darkness in media can make it feel more valuable. Because whether we conceptualize it this way or not, I think early art can be a kind of training ground for experiencing emotions before we have to feel them in the real world. And positive experiences don't necessitate training wheels. We don't need a trial run for having a great day or passing all our tests or living with a happy family. Maybe that's why I decided these were the first media I was too old for. I didn't want to be talked down to, and stories without conflict were exactly that. But dark stories, stories with death, or violence, or despair, now there were thought experiments that I wanted to play. How would I feel and act if I lost a loved one? Would I hold myself together if I knew the world was ending? How many orcs could I kill? That last one is seriously a conversation I had with myself all the time. Aragorn could kill dozens, and obviously I wasn't as strong or good as Aragorn, but maybe I could still take on three or four. And written well, these stories can be more than just directionless thought experiments, but guides introducing us to new strategies for difficult situations or warning us of potential pitfalls. I'm not saying any of this was conscious, I wasn't choosing books to learn how to deal with sadness, but sometimes that happened anyway, and often those would be the books I thought about the most. I've talked before about my love of the Animorphs series. Every time I went to the library I would check out about eight of them, never in order, just whatever they had. And by doing this repeatedly over a period of several years, I think I read almost all of them. 
except Megamorphs 2 in the time of dinosaurs. One of the reasons I was so infatuated with them was that they were violent and often scary, and the characters had to make really hard decisions. But as a kid, I never really thought about what the books were doing with this darkness. I just kind of liked their vibe. I was a kid. I bring up Animorphs because it's good as hell, but also because in the present, we have the rare treat of the author acknowledging the darkness and explaining its purpose, all without ruining the thing. After the finale of the series, she wrote this letter, which I've very slightly paraphrased. Animorphs spoilers, I guess? Quite a number of people seem to be annoyed by the final chapter in the Animorphs story. There are a lot of complaints that I let Rachel die, that I let Visser 3 slash 1 live, that Cassie and Jake broke up, that Tobias seems to have been reduced to unexpressed grief, that there was no grand final fight to end all fights, that there was no happy celebration, and everyone is mad about the cliffhanger ending. So I thought I'd respond. Animorphs was always a war story. Wars don't end happily, not ever. Some people who are brave and fearless in war are unable to handle peace. Always, people die in wars. And always, people are left shattered by the loss of loved ones. Here's what doesn't happen in war. There are no wondrous climactic battles that leave the good guys standing tall and the bad guys lying in the dirt. Life isn't a World Wrestling Federation Smackdown. Even the people who win a war, who survive and come out the other side with the conviction that they have done something brave and necessary, don't do a lot of celebrating. There's very little chanting of, we're number one, among people who've personally experienced war. I'm just a writer, and my goal was always to entertain. But I've never let Animorphs turn into just another painless video game version of war, and I wasn't going to do it at the end. And to tell you the truth, I'm a little shocked that so many readers seem to believe that I'd wrap it all up with a lot of high-fiving and backslapping. Wars very often end, sad to say, just as ours did, with a nearly seamless transition to another war. So, you didn't like the way our little fictional war came out. You don't like Rachel dead and Tobias shattered and Jake guilt-ridden. You don't like that one war simply led to another. Fine. Pretty soon, you'll all be of voting age and of draft age. So when someone proposes a war, remember that even the most necessary wars, even the rare wars where the lines of good and evil are clean and clear, end with a lot of people dead, a lot of people crippled, and a lot of orphans, widows, and grieving parents. If you're mad at me because that's what you have to take away from Animorphs, too bad. I couldn't have written it any other way and remained true to the respect I have always felt for Animorphs readers. I will not attribute my current day politics to Animorphs. I do not think they're the reason I don't like war. But I read these books so much as a kid. I read them far before I read about World War II or Vietnam or Iraq. And Applegate knew that one day I and all the other kids reading her books would read books and watch movies and consume propaganda about war. She knew that the world we lived in wasn't frictionless, and to pretend it was would be doing us a disservice. The darkness wasn't just Animorphs' hook, it was central to the series' ethos. If you didn't understand its darkest themes, you couldn't fully understand it. There is no such manifesto from the directors of Majora's Mask on why precisely they used the themes that they did, but you don't need to hear their explicit goals to understand why people care so much about it. It is a Zelda game about the end of the world, and it doesn't blunt that feeling because kids will be playing it. And as a result, Majora's Mask is both generally a fan favorite and the subject of so much theorization. Its undeniable darkness almost begs for analogies to the stages of grief, to climate change, to life after death. Majora's Mask lets its characters and its players live in darkness for so much longer than most media does. It doesn't snatch its apocalypse away. 
The game forces Link to examine it from every angle, and as he does, the questions of what you would do, who you would be, become unavoidable. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is the best-selling game in the franchise, a near-ubiquitous title for the near-ubiquitous Nintendo Switch. It's a reinvention of the series in a new genre, a reimagining of the traditional puzzle structures, a reason to be excited about open-world games again. Perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that, with every other change to the formula, Nintendo also decided to make Breath of the Wild the darkest Zelda. Breath of the Wild is explicitly, definitively, a post-apocalyptic game, albeit a very green one. Humanity only exists in small enclaves, separated by vast stretches of wilderness. The castle sits at the center of the kingdom, vast but uninhabitable, pulsing with evil. And littering the landscape are reminders of the main character's mistakes. These robotic guardians were created by the Sheikah, made by the good guys, but the robots were almost immediately corrupted and absolutely overwhelmed the kingdom. Hyrule built weapons of war, and those weapons only ushered in its own destruction. And the heroes of the game, Rivali and Urbosa and Daruk and Mifa, all died before they could meaningfully fight back. Link remains kept in suspended animation for a hundred years, and Zelda too imprisoned by overwhelming evil for just as long. And because they're still around a century later, they have to live with their defeat. Link unable to hold back the horde of corruption, Zelda incapable of using her powers until most of her friends were already dead. It is a game in which each acre, every abandoned stable and crumbled temple and forgotten spring is a monument to your failures. Contrary to the frustrated memes of kids in English classes, the curtains never have to be just blue in art. Subtext, metaphor, thematic parallels can be read from everything. You can draw meaning from a plot point or item description, even if the author thought they were just creating some curtains. And these interpretations are not inherently lesser, provided you can support them with evidence from the text. And as I said, being an adult with fully operational analytical abilities makes it fun to return to the media we enjoyed as kids. But often, I see a secondary motivation slip into this kind of nostalgic reinterpretation. Not only do people want to see if they can pull more meaning from childhood favorites, but we also want to validate the time we spent with it. And we do so by burdening these favorites with newfound, mature readings. I am no stranger to this, of course. I'm an adult who talks to other adults about video games. It's kind of part of the job. But this can also manifest in some of my least favorite types of analysis, a phenomenon I'll call secretly fucked up the whole time readings. You don't have to look far on the internet to find these. Turns out, the Rugrats are all dead, except for Angelica. Turns out, Nemo never existed, and Marlin is just coping with his dead fish wife. Turns out, every freaking story ever told is actually just a dream or hallucination in the mind of the dying protagonist. They're inane, purposeless fantasies that don't add any meaning to the story other than some abstract idea of, wouldn't it be messed up if this was the case? And while I recognize that a lot of these are essentially just people doing silly creative writing exercises, they're also fundamentally recontextualizing these stories as something they're not, ignoring the existing narrative and themes to construct ones of their own. At their worst, these theories not only try to mutate the media, but the audience. Finding Nemo, if it's a story of a father's hallucinated grief child, is no longer a movie for kids. If Willy Wonka is actually about sacrificing the contest winners to an elder god, then sure, your nephew might like Willy Wonka, but he doesn't really get it. Never mind that the actual stated narrative might be both interesting and enriching, it's all a cover for the real f***ed up story. This is most clearly illustrated in the popularity of icebergs for various media properties. Icebergs take the form of this picture, separated into several different levels with a variety of secrets and fan theories scattered across them. As you get deeper into the icebergs, the ideas only get more twisted. For instance, an iceberg on Mario might have 
Luigi is Mario's brother at the top. But get to the bottom and you've got every Mario character is a representation of a different deadly sin. Icebergs are fun and goofy, and often just a representation of how deeply a fan community has spiraled in on itself. But their structure also implies a direct correlation between darkness and knowledge of the media. To know that Luigi is Mario's brother requires only passing knowledge, but to comprehend the Seven Deadly Sins analogy necessitates deep, involved insight into the character's psyche. Or at least, that's what it gives the impression of. In reality, Luigi is Mario's brother, and the Mario characters are not representations of the Seven Deadly Sins. But such bizarre arguments take hold because of a two-part implicit hierarchy, that adult readings of media are superior to kiddie ones, and interpretations of media that are dark, twisted, and disturbing are inherently more adult than ones that are not. Although the cultural tide has rightfully turned, upon The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker's release, many fans were disappointed with the cel-shaded, quote-unquote, cartoony look of the game. Nintendo had previously shown a tech demo with a more realistic style, and so Wind Waker's brighter aesthetic was a surprise and letdown to some. The superficiality of this take is obvious, especially when considering that The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker is the darkest Zelda. It's partway through the game when you discover the nature of the oceans that cover the map. Because Wind Waker isn't set in a different location than the more terrestrial Zeldas, it's the same Hyrule, simply drowned, the first half of Noah's story, but the waters never receded. And like Noah, the devastating flood is theoretically divine, brought on not by Ganondorf, but by the gods in an effort to stop him. What ultimately stops him is not nature, but Link and the Master Sword, where floods failed, sharp, violent head trauma succeeds. But his demise isn't the most striking part of the game. That honor goes to the descent into old Hyrule, when you sink below the waves and enter a castle frozen in time, its spires stretching towards the surface and find it floating over a lake of lava and the rest of Castle Town apparently zombified, with terrifying re-deads grabbing you and shrieking. Link's expedited adulthood is met with a world that is darker in every way. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time loves to spring the sudden horror trope on you, whether that's a zombie in town, a detached hand that drops from the ceiling, or the bottom of a well full to the brim with skeletons and illusory walls. But none of these fleeting scares compare to where the game finishes. After repeatedly jumping forward and back in time, finishing off Ganondorf with another punishing final blow and sending him screaming back into the void, Zelda tells Link to go home, regain the time he lost. Home, she says, where you are supposed to be, the way you are supposed to be. She plays the ocarina, and Link is once more thrown into the past. But Link, the boy, is from a forest community where they never grow old and eternally live alongside a fairy companion. And Link's fate at the end of Ocarina of Time is neither of these things. He will grow old. We've seen him do it. And the last moments of the game see his fairy, his Link to the forest, wordlessly leave him. Link walks out of the Temple of Time alone, and realizes that the entire island, every person he's met, helped, connected with, is part of a dream. And the villagers' naivete doesn't make it any easier to confront the notion that ending the game means ending the dream, and ending the dream means ending all of this. It's a game where accomplishing Link's given goal means ignoring Link's emotional bonds, and while the island itself might not be real, those absolutely are. Link drops an entire island on the monster, but that isn't enough to stop it. Instead, the imprisoned transforms into Demise, a sort of primal god of anger and violence and blood. Demise first calls Zelda a bag of flesh, which, oof, and then fights you on a mirrored sea of clouds. What's so dismaying about Demise isn't just his physical intimidation, but his place in history. Skyward Sword is chronologically the very first Zelda, meaning that Demise's promise at the end of the game to be bound to Link eternally, to haunt him as the source of all monsters, to doom him to wander a blood-soaked sea of darkness, is a prophecy that comes true over and over and over again, meaning that humans have altogether abandoned the surface, hiding in caves, forced out of sight, 
Link isn't just an adventurer, he's the only adventurer in a dark world the exact size of the Light One, a twisted version of the Sacred Realm, a low rule that is essentially a world without a hero, a crumbling kingdom that created an antagonist whose only real motivation is to not let her world die, which is why A Link Between oh, Worlds and the Sword is the, the Darkest Zelda. Zelda. The problem, ultimately, is what that darkness leaves you with. I could write 90% of an essay on how any of these games are the darkest in their series, but then you get to the end and... what? Isn't it crazy how messed up this is? It's an empty reading, substanceless. Ironically, it's juvenile. Being messed up is not a theme, darkness is not a narrative, violence on its own is not mature. Every description I've given thus far is missing the crucial piece, the so what, the why should I care. Because Twilight Princess is not just about fighting and avant-garde choices and ominous visions. It's a game where those darker aspects framing the world make each act of kindness stand out more. Zelda's generosity, Link's inspiring bravery, every random townsperson's will to survive. It becomes a story about relying on others, a group of strangers able to survive in the twilight only due to the support they receive from each other. Link never succumbs to the ominous vision he received because he never attempts to do it alone. Unlike Ganondorf, Link's fight is never for individual glory. And at the end, Link loses one of his closest friends, not through violence or tragedy but because they both understand they have a responsibility to their own homes. Midna leaves because her community needs her, and she, now, understands how important her support is to them. And Majora's Mask isn't just about the inevitable end of the world. It's about recognizing that inevitability, and still choosing to fight against it, resisting what seems inescapable with every last breath, if Majora's Mask is a metaphor for grief, or climate change, or whatever else, it's a metaphor that begs you to not lay down and accept them. Although time moves inexorably forward, and yes, everyone will eventually die, that doesn't mean that the present is a lost cause. And even in the midst of Link's own grief, he finds meaning in helping others. And Breath of the Wild may live in the post-apocalypse, but God, what a reminder that whatever we consider the apocalypse is that in name only. Although whatever we considered the world pre-disaster may have ended, there's still a world here, and it's alive and passionate and wants to be heard. Link and Zelda may blame themselves for the passing of the old world, but their guilt doesn't prevent them from trying to heal the new one. And for everyone else, they don't particularly feel like they're living in the aftermath of something terrible. Life just adapts it keeps on happening. To brand any of these games as the darkest Zelda is to miss the forest for the trees, focus on the storytelling methods without considering what the stories themselves are doing with them. Heroism shines when contrasted with the darkness, acts of compassion mean more when stakes are high. And this perspective also misses the levity of the stories and what those moments contribute as well. A world without joy and humor isn't a compelling world to fight for. Every one of these games become meaningful through their lightest elements, absurd side characters and silly mini-games, and the idea of Link not being heavy until he takes the metal boots out of his pocket and puts them on his feet. Zelda games flourish in this twilight, the melding of light and dark. The disparate tones mutually empower each other. And Wind Waker may float above the ruins of a past world, but our characters float too, kept aloft by an incredible sense of exploration, the open ocean beckoning them in any way they choose. And Link may not get to live in the perpetual adolescence of Kokiri Forest, but he learns that the world offers him so much more, that Hyrule is so much richer and more varied than the tiny woods he was previously confined to. He goes from a boy who doesn't fit in, to an adult who learns he can adapt to anything, face any task, and then he's able to take that knowledge forward with him, leaving the island not with a sense of dread, but hope. He's clinging to a plank, floating in the middle of the ocean, but Link smiles with acceptance, with confidence in his choice, 
with the memory of Marin who soars overhead? The game refuses to spell it out for us, but we can only assume that after his confrontation with Demise, Link isn't dispirited, but self-assured. Demise has promised to return again and again, but Link is strong enough to fight him, and what's more, he isn't alone. He has glimpsed the basest, most destructive aspects of his world, and yet it's still beautiful. He flies forward knowing every corner of the once imposing land. The forests, deserts, and mountains that were once so hostile are now familiar to him, and the princess relents and sends them home, finally realizing that the stability of her own kingdom isn't worth the death of another, and Link touches the Triforce with a wish, not for ultimate power, but simply to save the ones he loves. And we're left at the end. With darkness, yes, a threat that never quite disappears. But we're left with hope, too. Because Ganondorf is the hottest Zelda character. Because Ganondorf is the hottest Zelda character. I'm sorry, I've tried and I've tried, but I just can't get my eyebrows to connect to my hairline. I don't think it's possible. Anyway, this video is sponsored by Henson Shaving. <laughs> I am someone who, even in non-ridiculous situations, shaves a lot. And since I first got a razor of theirs six or so months ago, I have been totally infatuated with my Henson razor. Here's the spiel. This is a safety razor, the kind that was in fashion before advertisers convinced us we needed seven blades and gel coatings and all that trash. It uses actual razor blades, which cost literal pennies per use compared to high-tech solutions, and especially on this Henson, the whole piece is so precision engineered that the shave is as smooth as anything I've ever experienced. Henson is one of my favorite sponsors I've worked with, and one of the reasons why is I'm selling you on this. Not a free trial, not a subscription razor service, just this, a really nice razor you buy once. Here's a true story. A longtime family friend just bought this razor for his son as a graduation present after I told him I actually used it. Also, it's not just for beards. You can use this on your legs, your armpits, whatever. And because they gave me a promo, you'll get a hundred free blades with the purchase of a razor with the code Jacob. Put them both in your cart and it'll knock the price of the blades off at checkout. Honestly, I hope they never stop sponsoring me. Because A, I get to keep doing these crimes to my face, and B, I sincerely believe that this is one of those little things that you buy once and it makes your life better multiple times a week. Follow the link in the description and use code JACOB to get 100 free blades when you buy a razor.